the number one question Christians and non-believers have today is that if God is a God of love, why did he allow all this death and suffering? Why does he allow 9-11 and famines and tsunamis? But if Christianity is a valid, reasonable faith, we should have answers to those questions, and we do. But the great problem is that we've rejected the Bible's history and the creation account. I would say to a Christian, how would you answer a non-believer, a skeptic, an evolutionist, if he says to you, why should I be saved? It's very simple. What am I being saved from? Gary, I meet a lot of people who are angry with God. Frequently, I find it's because of death and suffering. We all experience it. Now, you've talked on this subject um, hundreds of times all over the world. Now, you said to me that there's two different views of death and that greatly impacts our worldview and therefore how we live our life. Can you explain what these two views are? Yeah, sure. Well, there are only two games in town when it comes to creation, how we got here. You know, either we evolved, there was a big bang 14 billion years ago and we're the product of time and chance and evolution rules, or there is a creator. So our views on how we came about greatly inform the position on death. Okay, and so you're saying there's an evolutionary worldview and there's a biblical worldview. Yeah. And they're the two views on death. Now, I'm pretty sure someone who says they've got an evolutionary worldview would say, look, I don't think my belief in evolution affects the way I view death. How would you answer that? Well, it does. Uh, that's why I mentioned views about where we came from. L let me explain it this way. I love to distill it this way. You know the three big questions we talk about, and we talk about them inside the church and outside the church. And the three big questions are, where do we come from? Why am I here? What's my meaning and purpose to life? And the third one, of course, is what happens to us when we die. So when I said two games in town, so if evolution is true, okay, you and I, everybody, we are just a giant cosmic accident. Well, then ultimately there is no meaning and purpose to life. You're mm. born, you die. But when you die, what happens? Is there any life after death in that scenario? No, there isn't. Now, the other view, if God is creator, as Christians, we believe we were created with meaning and purpose. Our meaning and purpose is in him. And of course, the decisions in this life, well, they're going to affect where we spend eternity. So that's the answer to number three. So ultimately, your answer to question one determines your answers to questions two and three. Right, so where we're going after we die depends on where we think we came from. Exactly. Christians believe that we're living in God's creation and that God is good, therefore it should reflect his character. So why does creation have death and suffering in it? Well, oh, I understand why Christians would ask that question, but it's almost a type of question a non-Christian, a non-believer would ask. In other words, it's a bit of a challenge. I think what we see in the world with death and suffering is a reflection of what happened in history. So a lot of people say, well, if God's good, why doesn't nature, the world, reflect his, his character? The Bible's history says creation was originally good. In fact, on the days of creation, God said it was good, good, good. And on the sixth day, he said it was very good. That's how it's translated in English. The word there is, in Hebrew, tov miod, which means finished, completion, perfection. But the Bible indicates something went wrong. Sin, when, what is sin? You know, people say, well, I'm not a sinner, but sin is defined as rebellion from God, not acknowledging who he is, following his ways, uh, recognizing that he is the creator. So we are living in a, a good creation that's gone bad, and there were consequences for sin. God put a curse on this earth, things went bad. So when we are looking out at creation today and seeing bad things, it should be actually a reminder of what went wrong. It's not God's fault, ultimately, it's our fault. Mm, yeah, because I see that a lot, people being angry at God, <laughs> because especially with uh, non-Christians that have experienced suffering, they say, how could have God created a world like this? He's, he's not good. Uh, so that's really clear and really obvious. So why do we not have this answer then? Why is it not 
um, ready on our lips as Christians to answer the non-Christians? Yeah, I think because uh, most Christians have been through public education, you and I have, and we're taught evolution. Evolution is a process that says human beings came about by a process of death and suffering and culling out the weak. You know, then you've got to look at passages that say, you know, when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, that's a bit inconsistent with the teachings of Christ. So seeing death and suffering in the world, if people believe that's the scientific method of how the world came to be, you and I evolved, then they're saying, well, God used the process of death and suffering. Mm. That would obviously make him a cruel creator. And to be honest, Scott, if God did use a process of evolution to create, I wouldn't want to worship him either because in that scenario, we've had millions of unfit species go extinct and that uh, Jesus says God cares about the sparrow, does he not feed him, etc. Wow, so it sounds like, Gary, the problem is when we try and mix the two worldviews. So if, in my example, I was saying when the non-Christian says, hey, I'm angry with God because of death and suffering, and then if we don't have an answer, that's maybe because we're saying, well, we've accepted the evolutionary worldview. Um, because if you, and, and I guess the reason those people, the non-Christians are angry with God is because they think God used evolution because they're taught evolution is true. And if they think the earth has been a harsh place for four and a half billion years, the universe a harsh place for mm -hmm. over 13 billion years, then they just import God into that worldview. Well, God created that. Yeah. But what you're saying is that's not the story. No. Scott, in all the churches I've ministered in in my 30 years of ministry and speaking to Christians and pastors and having non-believers come up, unquestionably the number one question Christians and non-believers have today is that if God is a God of love, why did he allow all this death and suffering? And their view is that he created that way. And a lot of Christians will say when they're challenged by non-believers, well, if God's good, you know, why does he allow you know, 9-11 and, and famines and tsunamis? And we don't answer the question. The majority answer I believe that most Christians give is, well, we don't know those things now, but you know, when we get to heaven, we'll find out. Well, I can tell you that was the number one question I had when I was not a Christian and I was mm. challenging my Christian friends. It was like, well, kind of don't worry about it. But if Christianity is a valid, reasonable faith, you know, we should have answers to those questions, and we do. But the great problem is that so much in the church, we've rejected the Bible's history and the creation account. The creation account, you know, is, is supposedly contentious, particularly when we're talking about the time frames and the age of the earth and the days of creation. So if we reject that, very soon after the creation, it talks about mankind's rebellion. So even Christians who believe in evolution, they believe that we're sinners and Christ came to redeem us from sin. And I say, well, which book in the Bible do you have to go to to find the origin of sin? It, guess what? It's back in the book of Genesis. Mm. You're kind of having two bob each way and there's a, a massive inconsistency in, I believe, someone's apologetic in their faith if they're trying to witness to someone about the salvation of Christ, but at the same time they say, yeah, but don't worry about the creation account in Genesis. Wow. So you're saying if we're a Christian and we're trying to tell a non-Christian, hey, God's a good God, and hey, God wouldn't put all this death and suffering into the world, well, you're going to be compromised if you've believed in an evolutionary worldview because you're probably not taking the first few chapters of Genesis as they're written. And therefore, God was the one that put the suffering there. Exactly. But the, in chapter three, it clearly says that original death, the way death came into the world was through Adam and Eve, not through yeah. God. It's very simple. I would say to a Christian, how would you answer a non-believer, a skeptic, an evolutionist, uh, if he says to you, why should I be saved? It's very simple. What am I being saved from? Hebrews 9.3 tells us that without death, there is no remission of sins. Why did God bring a, a substitution? You know, all those years with the tabernacle, there was a substitutionary atonement, right? It was a part-time thing, if you want to put it that way. Animals were being sacrificed. The priests would lay their hands on it, transfer the sin of the people to those animals, and that animal would eventually be killed. That was a temporary measure because ultimately Jesus, the very Lamb of God, would be the one that would take away the sins of the world. And 
again, if we accept evolution and we try that to add that to the Bible, evolution is a record of death. That means God has is the one that instituted death. Now, in a way, he did institute death when he put a curse on the earth. Mm -hmm. So the next question people ask us is, of course, why did God institute a curse? Yes. So, yeah, I was going to ask how, why, yeah. because it's because you basically they could say, okay, you're saying that death and suffering don't come from God. That it was Adam and Eve's fault, but it was God who, who was the one that given the curse. So, and I've had that ask, Gary. How mm. how do we answer that one? Well, again, if we take the Bible's history at face value, Adam and Eve, and us as their descendants, we would have lived eternally. He was created to be an eternal being. So once humanity rebelled from God we would have been eternally separated from God. That's an unthinkable thing. Wow. So now, believe it or not, it's actually only through death that we can be reconciled back to our Creator. So we have to go through, if you like, the fires of death, but we have to believe in the one whom God sent, and then for we can be reconciled back to our Creator. And when we're reconciled back to our Creator, that gets back to the basis of question one. There can be no greater meaning and purpose in life, Scott, than to find out who made us and to be reconciled back to him. And even though the Bible's history said we rebelled from God, he, he actually has made a way, right, for us to get back to him. God sent a rescue mission, right, to humanity in the form of Jesus Christ. So can we just cover that point again? It sounded like you were saying it was a mercy of God to put the curse upon us. Um, can you explain that? So we, so first of all, we're living. Um, Adam and Eve, they were going to live eternally. Everything was good. You said it was very good. Mm -hmm. And that was the, God's original plan. Um, but then because of Adam and Eve's rebellion, it was a mercy of God to put the curse on them that they would die. Am, am I saying that correct? Yes. Would you agree? Yes. See, we always think about Adam and Eve being cursed, but actually if you read Genesis 3, it tells us the ground was cursed, the plants were cursed. The whole of creation was cursed. We read about the heavens and earth. Well, that's been affected by Adam's sin. That's why God will eventually make a new heavens and earth. Mm. And so we talk about sin, we, t we tend to think about personal sin. Well, we can understand why people fly planes into buildings or you know, steal your widescreen TV and break into your house and commit murders. But when we see things in nature too, right, it's a, it's a sign that the earth is also under bondage to decay. That's what it tells us uh, in Romans. And that's why I made the point earlier that when we see things happening, th things going wrong, it should be a reminder when there are earthquakes, uh, in the world that kill thousands or tsunamis, or whether our own family members die, it's a reminder of what went wrong. You know, in the last few years, Scott, I've lost my dad, my sister to cancer a few years ago. Mm. And then during COVID, I'm living in the United States and my brother is basically given months to live. Well, because of lockdowns and, and whatever, and I'm, I'm not here to discuss those, but I could not actually get back to Australia to see my brother. Oh. I had to say goodbye to him on the phone. It's one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. I had to watch his funeral online. Gosh. And I can understand, you know, people would say, well, I'm angry at God, but I was angry at sin. Wow. I can honestly say to you, I thought, this is the problem with the world we live in. And part of the problem is it's my fault. I'm a descendant of Adam. You don't have to teach people how to do wrong things. From the moment we're born, you don't have to teach children to misbehave and to rebel. Mm. That's part of our nature. Mm. And so the only remedy for us is to accept Christ. Because, you know, people say, well, what did God do about all the suffering in the world? Mm. He did something. He sent Jesus. And here's the next picture, okay, the big picture, because we're so focused on this life. This is not the main game. This is not the grand final. It's the world to come. We're not saved just for this life. We've been saved for the world to come. Wow. And that having that perspective, I imagine, is going to be, well, I, I can almost guarantee is going to be 
a lot more helpful when you go through personal tragedy, like some of the things you were just describing. If you know that this life is not all there is, and there's an age to come that will last forever and ever, <laughs> then this life is just a small blip. Um, not saying those things were not painful, but I imagine in light of eternity, you were able to get through some of those things. Yes, because I realized the problems that afflict me, as I mentioned, as a result of sin. Look, does this take God by surprise? Again, if we read scripture, Jesus says, you will have trouble. Now, anybody watching this, if, if you're, you're looking online, anybody here never had trouble in their life. Mm. You will have trouble mm. because he recognized we live in a cursed and fallen world. When he visited the tomb of his friend Lazarus, it says, Jesus wept. Why, why did he weep? He had the power to restore him, which he did. But I believe that the creator was grieved at what sin had done to his creation, mm. that it can cause the pain of loss, can cause the pain of suffering. And so when people go through those things, I've had so many Christians come up to me and say, you know, why did God allow this to happen? Well, I'd say it's a reflection of the world that we're in. Mm. And that's the very, very reason that we need Christ. And, and some people will say, well, hang on, you know, but I'm not a sinner. I, I don't rob banks. I don't do those types of things. Mm. But it's not the gravity of the offense that's the problem. It's who we're offending. Mm. It's who, who we are sinning against. And whether it's, you know, humanly speaking, the smallest sin or the worst one, it doesn't matter in terms of our offense before the creator who made us, the gravity of the offense is the same. Yeah, a lot of people I speak to, Gary, when evangelizing will say something to the effect of, look, I'm not, I'm not too bad. I'm going to do OK. Um, and I think w when I ask them questions further, I find out that they're actually comparing themselves with Hitler or comparing themselves with uh, a mass murderer or a rapist. And they're, they're saying, comparatively, I seem to be doing OK. But as you're saying, mm. the, the, the problem is sin is still sin. You know, if I could say that, I, I remember... I was back in Australia when 9-11 occurred and for the whole week after, you know, there was literally 24-7 coverage on the TV. And I remember, I won't mention him by name, but one of Australia's most famous TV hosts at the time was well known for his antipathy to Christianity. And he was interviewing a Salvation Army grief counsellor. And, uh, you know, Salvos did a great job when there's, there's train crashes and they go there to try to provide counsel for you know, loved ones that are, that are suffering. And he turned around to the Salvation Army officer and he said, well, you, do you believe that God is creator? And he said, well, yes. And he said, well, if he's creator, he said, and he's supposedly in control, he said, why didn't he do something to stop these terrorists flying planes into buildings? And the Salvation Army officer turned around and said, well, let me ask you, he said, is God in control of your life? Wow. <laughs> wow, what an answer. <laughs> You see, ultimately, there's, it gets back to the root of the problem. And so whether we look at creation falling, and as I said, you know, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, the bushfires, uh, and there, there might be some human causes to some of those things, but, and or our personal sin, our inhumanity to one another, they both have the same root cause, sin. The ground was cursed, the plants was cursed, and humans were cursed also as a result. And so that's why the whole of creation also has to be restored. Mm. And now I want to ask you a question about creation, and it's why did God curse his creation? But before that, I just want to pick up something you said about Jesus and Jesus uh, weeping at the death of Lazarus. And, and so I was just thinking at that moment, well, if you're trying to mix your worldviews and you're trying to have this evolutionary worldview, why would... God be sad. Why, why was Jesus sad about death and suffering if he was the one that instituted it at the beginning? And it's almost like, and, and Jesus went about healing, healing mm. sicknesses and diseases. Gary, how do, how do people mix, have an evolutionary worldview and try to be a Christian at the same time and then say healing is, is what Jesus did? Like, why would Jesus heal? Is that, is that a fair question to ask? Well, when Jesus healed, what was he doing? He was actually refer, reversing the effects of the curse. Yeah. So early missionaries, when we went out to third world countries, it wasn't just to take the gospel, but we, we took other things. We taught 
health benefits, uh, sanitation, all of those things that improve the stock of mankind. And of course, you find a lot of those even health laws in scripture uh, as well. So yes, there is a, a bit of an inconsistency because the big problem, as I mentioned before, is people think death is normal. You say, well, yeah, you're going to die someday. But according to God, death is not normal. And he even describes it as an enemy, doesn't he? The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Yeah, I think that nails it there. If God says the last, it's an enemy, then it's not his what he used to create. He didn't use this evolutionary process of death, surely not, because he says it's an enemy and he's going to put it under his feet. So that question I wanted to ask you, uh, some people will ask, well, look, it was Adam and Eve that sinned. They, they deserve the curse. What about creation? What about all the animals? Well, the whole of creation was cursed in mm -hmm. Genesis 3. Why, why did God do that? Well, um, human beings are kind of, uh, you know, to quote an evolutionary term, we're kind of the top of the food chain. So Adam and Eve were given responsibility of creation. When God says, God says go and subdue or fill the earth, Adam and Eve, Adam in particular, was the federal head of creation. So he actually knew, in a sense, that what he would do, his consequences, he was responsible for the world around him. Mm. So once he sinned, it actually had universal consequences. And, you know, remember, God said immediately, what have you done? And if we read scripture, Adam was very, very well aware uh, of his offense from the moment he did it. He, he, he realized he'd offended the one who made him. Okay, so he, he was in charge, he was responsible, everything got cursed with him. So Gary, instead of seeing all the cancer and death and earthquakes and tsunamis in the world and shaking our fist at God and saying, you know, why have you created like the, the world like this? It should remind us, actually, something's wrong. Mm. Something went wrong. And we can't do anything to save ourselves no. from this sin-cursed world. No. Uh, can you give us some examples from scripture that talk about this? Yeah, there are several, but one of my favorite and a much discussed book is the book of Job. Um, and of course, we know the story, Satan, which means the accuser, he stands before God and he says to God, look at Job who be made. Oh, sorry, God says first, he says, look to Satan, look at Job. He's, God calls him righteous. God even calls Job a righteous man. Effectively, Satan's accusation is that the only reason uh, Job loves you is because of all the good things he's got, you know, his wealth and his privilege in his life. And so imagine poor Job. He, he's got no idea of this conversation happening in the heavenlies. And basically God says, okay, well, do your worst. And we read that Job gets sick. His friends come along. I mean, isn't this relevant today? Why are all these bad things happening to you? Have you caused offense to God? What sin have you got going on in your life? His wife says, curse God and die family members die, etc. And, you know, Job is human. He complains. He, he kind of, he whines. But I think it's fascinating if you read the book towards the end of the book of Job, God starts talking to him in creation passages. Mm. Job, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, my perspective there is God saying, don't, do you think I see what's happening? You, mm. Can't you... You know, understand, I can see what's happening in your life. And if I could read a passage just so I can be accurate yeah. from, from the book of Job. Job knew he was a sinner and he, through those creation passages, he knew that God was capable of raising his dusty bones back from the ground. And in Job 19, verses 25 to 27, for me, this is one of the most powerful passages in the whole Bible and mm -hmm. I always get goosebumps when I read it. So Job stands there and he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. Mm. See, Job didn't have just now in mind, he had a future. Now, the thing with Job, he didn't have the benefit of the incarnation. Christ hadn't come, but he knew ultimately that God was going to save him in the end. And that, that there, 
he's talking about a physical uh, a physical resurrection. Yeah. In my flesh, in my own eyes, I shall stand upon the earth. My Redeemer lives. Wow, what a hope, Gary. What an incredible testimony yeah, just that we have just from Job with all the suffering that he went through. Yeah, because people are going through suffering today, Gary, but the... Yeah, maybe we should read the book of Job more because the, the suffering he went through was, I mean, it's just almost indescribable. Um, yet he still came out with that statement. Um, yeah. He had a hope of the resurrection. Now, Gary, I'm wondering, is this the reason why, because this doesn't always happen. Often as Christians, a lot of us, we can go through suffering and say, why God? And, and we do ask those questions like mm -hmm. you're saying, oh, have I done something wrong? Or has someone else done something to me? Or like, what's happening? Why, wh why are you making me suffer? Um, what, why do we do that? Why do we not have Job's response? Why do we not say, you know what, whatever happens, I know that I'm going to see God in the flesh. And um, yeah, what, why, why are we not more like Job? I, I think there could be multiple reasons. One is our world, particularly Western societies, we're obsessed with wealth, status, my position now, and we just don't necessarily have an eternal perspective. You know, as I said, this is not the main game. It's it's the one to come where we're not going to have uh, all of these things. So again, that's more mixing worldviews there. The worldview is, hey, it's all about now. It's all about wealth. state. And then if we, sometimes we get that mixed up in our head as Christians thinking, oh, I'm suffering now, so everything's going bad. But really, we've got to rip that worldview out of our head. We need to have the Christian worldview. Yeah. Well, I, and I think there's another thing. We kind of think of the new heavens and earth as as somehow inferior to what we have now for those things. I mean, it's just going to be a spiritual place. I've heard that. So. And I've met so many that believe we're just going to be some sort of ghostly, ethereal spirit beings floating around in the new heavens and earth. Well, that's not an adequate replacement for what was lost. Mm. And in fact, the reason I mentioned before about the new heavens and earth we read in, or sorry, the heavens and earth that God created in Genesis 1 are reserved for destruction. Think about this, death came to creation. So as long as there is a fossil in the ground, that's a reminder of death. You know, some people believe that God's just gonna kind of shake the dust off this globe and we're gonna be restored here. No, all that death there is in the fossil record. So leaving that there, I kind of think Satan wins. That's the problem. And so a new heavens and earth completely resurrected, restored, uh, just like you and I. I'm not going to have the same body, but I'm going to be completely restored and resurrected in renewed bodies. And of course, it's going to be a physical creation. Mm. You know, we read about the tree of life being there again. And if I could read a couple more passages out that really yeah, points this out, because Revelation 21 and 22, they're the last two chapters in the Bible. In Revelation 21, it says, and God shall wipe, wipe away all tears from their eyes. Mm. That's what we have today. Whether you're a, an evolutionist or a Christian, please don't tell me you're reconciled with death. Even though an evolutionist might say, death is normal, it's the way, of course we all grieve at the loss of a loved one. And he said, goes on, it says, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things have passed away. And then in the midst, and it's talking about the new Jerusalem, there was the tree of life. And here's the kicker, and there shall be no more curse. That's the last chapter in the whole Bible, Revelation 22. And where is that pointing back to when it says, and there shall be no more curse? What's it talking about? We've got to go back to the book of Genesis to understand the introduction of the curse. And so if you are a Christian who's added evolution to the Bible and you believe that God used a process of millions of years of evolution and death and suffering and culling out the weak and the Bible says there's going to be a restoration, mm. is he going to be restoring things to millions of years of death and suffering? That's really not much blessed hope to look forward to. But as Christians, we believe, no, what the Bible says, those things are going to be gone. They're going to be passed away. And we're going to enter into a, a new heavens and a new earth. We get an indication for revelation. There are streets, that there will be buildings. And so this is something definitely, if you think this 
some parts of this existence are good, and they are. Mm. But I think it pales to compared to what is awaiting us. And part of that is a prize, Scott, mm. for enduring what we're going through now. So when people say, wow, you know, is God a God of love? That's actually an incredible story of love because guess what? When things went wrong and we rebelled against God, we messed up his creation. It's his. <laughs> we failed the nest. Even though it's his creation, it belongs to him, he made it, we messed it up. And God sends a rescue mission out of heaven to pay the penalty that should have been ours. So in reality, um, you know, we didn't get what we deserve. Mm. God himself took upon the penalty for all of that. And that's called, commonly called grace. Mm. Uh, also, you might say, unmerited favor. Mm. We got what we didn't deserve. So we might be angry with God if we experience suffering in this life. If we have bought in a bit of the um, secular worldview that it is all about this life, it's about our happiness, our health, mm. our wealth, and if we lose some of our health or wealth or happiness, then it's God's fault because yeah. that's the thing that we're here for. But what you're saying is the Bible doesn't talk about this. If we restore the beginning as real and the end as real, we know the beginning was good and the end is going to be good. And it's a real place. The new heavens and the new earth is a real place, you were mm. saying. And I can see that makes a lot of sense. If we are looking forward um, to a reality and we're not just looking forward to something ethereal, because if you're looking forward to something ethereal, like how are you going to, what are you yeah. looking forward to? You're probably going to put your, your, um, treasure in this life. And it reminded me of this passage. I had to look it up. It's John 12, 25. And it says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And I, I wonder whether um, us in the Western world, um, Christians in the Western world that uh, experience a lot of um, health and wealth, uh, whether we really need to know more than ever now, as we're experiencing more health and wealth, that the age to come is a reality. And we need to recognize that death is something present with us and that this isn't our treasure. Yeah. This isn't what we're hoping for. Uh, we're hoping for what's to come. So I, yeah, that, was, that, that really answers that question well, Gary. Um, now, I wanted to ask you a question before I, I, I move on to another question about the new heavens and the new earth. I, I was reminded as you were talking of, uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, when I was evangelizing on the street and someone had come up to me and we were talking about death and his question to me, which I, I think I answered okay, but I want to hear what you would say was, look, I think death is natural. He says, death is a natural thing. And I tried to challenge him on that. I said, okay, do you want to die? <laughs> and he said, yeah, it's a natural thing. I want to die. I was like, well, do you want to die now? <laughs> I said, and he said, no, I don't want to die now. And I said, look, all of us here, we've got an instinct. We want to live. Um, and I try and use that as a basis for connecting Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter who you are. We recognize that death is an enemy. Um, but I wonder if that was the right approach or how, how you might have talked about that. Well, you talk to people in the military and they'll tell you there's no atheists in foxholes uh. because the very next moment they could die. And the story you just told me there, you said, you know, do you want to die now? Are you ready? Well, no. So really embedded in that answer is, well, no, I want to live my life and, and do the things I want to do. But yeah, there's a reality eventually I'm going to die. But here's the point. We don't get to choose the time we die. And Jesus warned us about that. You know, this very minute your life might be taken from you. Mm -hmm. And and that's a, a great example. Uh, you know, we don't know when it's going to happen. You know, when at 9-11, when people went to work that day and, you know, went into their office on the sec 72nd floor or whatever, did they think a plane was mm. going to fly through the, the office window? Mm. I mean, I'm not trying to make light of that, but that's how bizarre and, and serious, you know, the responsibilities we have of living in this world and thinking about eternity and what happens to us. You know, I'm sitting here right now, God forbid, I could, you know, be walking on my way home and something could be mad happen to me. But that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation, because you don't know what's going to happen to you 
tomorrow. So yes, whilst the evolutionist says he he he's you know yes he's going Death to is die. Death natural. Yeah, but he's he's not going to get the time and place to choose when it happens. Yeah, and he won't be reconciled with that. Mm. Yeah. So even though they say death is natural, we s still none of us want to die. And if I mean, some people do and have suicidal tendencies, but we treat them as they're having a mental condition. Uh, yeah. Some of people that. are just desperately unhappy with this world, Scott. Mm. But I'd suggest that's because they don't have a big end game picture in in mind. What's the point of living this life if it's just there's nothing at the end? And that is a big consequence, you know, I think for people that don't understand Christianity and the Bible. And and so many people in the world today I found, you know, they reject God on the basis of not understanding the gospel, not understanding what God actually did and not understanding that the world we live in uh, was not made that way originally by God because mm. they see God as an ogre, not as a God of love if he's created this miserable world as some may think. Gary, you mentioned 9-11 and the tragedy mm. that happened there. Um, when people do things like that, fly planes into buildings, how are we to respond? Yeah, you remember I just mentioned that um, no one expected when they went to work that day that something was going to happen to them. but. There are some scriptural passages I could read that from the Lord himself that really relate to this. And uh, Jesus was asked similar questions. So it tells us that some were gathered there. When you read in Luke 13, starting at verse 1, it says, There were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate, that's Pontius Pilate, mm -hmm. had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So Jesus didn't say, uh, you know, oh, they suffered this way because, you know, they were worse sinners. I mean, that was the accusation pointed at Job. What he's just saying is you need to be saved. You need to repent because you might be the next face in the crowd the pilot pulls out. And then it goes on later in Luke, and he says, all those 18 who died when the Tower of Salome fell on them. And he says it again, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. So Jesus' answer is, you don't know when a building's going to fall on you. Mm -hmm. You don't know when you're going to be a face in the crowd. You don't know when a, a plane's going to crash into the building. But unless you repent, in other words, unless you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your saviour, acknowledge that you're a sinner, you too will per perish. Yeah. And death, here's the thing, it's not the end. The evolutionist might think death is the end, but it isn't. Mm. It's only the beginning of the next life to come. And as I said right at the beginning, the decisions you make in this life are going to affect where you spend eternity. Scott, there is nothing I can do to please God. You know, people might be listening to this and they, oh, he's such a pious man. Well, <laughs> they don't know me. You know, e every day I, I can have a wrong thought or a, a wrong motive for doing something. We are all incapable of pleasing God because of our sin nature. And that's why the sinless Lamb of God had to come to take our place. Mm. It's such an incredible story. When I think about who God is, if he is the creator of this incredibly vast universe and he chose this little rocky planet to create life, to have fellowship with him, and when it went wrong, that incredible creator stepped out of there and came here to make a way so that you and I can be redeemed back to our creator. It's just an incredible story. And, and as I said, people want to know that God's a God of love. Well, mm. there it is. Mm. Amazing. Thanks, Gary. I, I'm particularly amazed by that story you told in Luke, uh, that you read that passage out. It seems like Jesus used the opportunity of a natural disaster and of someone doing something immensely evil to preach the gospel. Like it might be said today that if you were to use a natural disaster to preach the gospel, might be, you might be saying that's insensitive. These people mm. lost their lives. I think the key, what you're saying here, Gary, is this life is not all that there is. Yeah. Um, and because we know that, and because Jesus knew that, he would use even the worst and the best of circumstances to tell people the truth. Um, now, Gary, 
it might be some people watching that are not believers. They're just exploring faith. In fact, I know that. I've met people mm. that watched some of our other videos and they said, look, I've, I've started to come towards faith because of some of these videos. But what would you say to them? Um, and how would you encourage them to, I mean, obviously you want to make, encourage them to make a commitment to, to the Lord, yeah. but, but why should they do that? Well, everything we have in this life is temporary. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, I'm not taking my nice car with me to heaven. Uh, I'm not taking, you know, if you're a teen watching, you're not taking your PlayStation or your Xbox with you, whatever gives you great pleasures in this life. And as I said, this, this life is not the end. The next life yeah. is a beginning. And so we can't take anything that with you. Jesus has a passage in Luke 12, parable of the rich man and the fool. And he says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? They're all gonna, all gonna they're temporary. And even to the Christians, when I say that sometimes our focus is too much on storing up things for ourselves, what are we taking to heaven with us? I often say, is there anything we're taking to heaven? And I, the answers I get are, are no, but actually there is something we're taking to heaven with us. And that is the people that we lead to the Christ. You know, I'm, I'm a former evolutionist, former atheist, and I was the first person to get saved in my family, okay, as an adult. And I mentioned my dad and my sister who died, both became Christians. I've seen the majority of my family saved. And so what would I sacrifice? What would I give away in this world if I had to, to see them come with me? Wow, this could You'd be give everything, wouldn't you? Yeah. But in God's mercy, mm. you know, I was able to lead them to the Lord. Mm. And I know they're there. And I know that I'm going to see them again. You know, mm. my, my sister who got saved after me, I, it was a bizarre situation. I, I was living in Brisbane with working for the ministry. She, she was in Perth and she was given a few days to live. And fortunately, I, I went back to see her and she was there in her bed and she knew she was only got a, a short time. And I had to be back, you know, in Brisbane and I said goodbye to her. D just like you and I sitting here now, I said goodbye, said a prayer, and we both knew that in this life, we weren't gonna be seeing each other again. And I cried like a baby. Mm. And even though I was the first one to be saved, my sister said, don't cry, we're going to see each other again. <laughs> Incredible. Awesome. Yeah. She had that faith at that moment in her life. Mm. And so that's what I say. That's the blessed hope that we have. And, and when we're, we're restored, it's not going to be some miserable existence, like we said. Mm. You know, Genesis gives us a glimpse. We look to Genesis for what the new heavens and earth would be are going to be like. And so we started off talking about Christians and non-believers. And, and as I say, I want to repeat, when we look out at this world, even though we might say it's incredible and it's beautiful, there's death in the world. There are bad things that happen. And Jesus says in Matthew 5.45, he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. See, sinner and saint, we're all sharing this same sin-cursed world. So Christians might ask, why me? You know, I'm a Christian. I've followed you all my life. Jeremiah had a similar complaint. I have to be honest and say, why not me? Why not me? That passage tells us. Why not me, Scott? Mm. I'm a sinner. But the difference is, as I said, I've not just been saved to this world uh, but the next one to come. And then Jesus, I said before, he said, in this world you will, have, you will have trouble. But then he goes on and he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So when we look at Jesus raised from the dead, it gives us an example that God has the power of resurrection. Mm -hmm. He has the power to restore and I remember some time, uh, it was actually a pastor said to me, he said, Gary, when I look at the new heavens and the new earth, it seems too fantastic. And I'm like, do you believe that God created? He goes, yeah. And I said, well, he did it once. <laughs> Don't you think he can do it again? 
Absolutely. And that's, again, we get back to why the creation aspect of this story mm. is so important. You know, what we've really shared here today is the gospel. It starts in the book of Genesis and we read in the book of Revelation where it finishes. It's tied together, it shows one, the unity of scripture. But God is undoing in the book of Revelation, those last two chapters, everything that went wrong at the beginning. And as I said, if you don't believe those beginning parts, I think, I'm not saying you're not a Christian, of course, but I think there's a glaring inconsistency in one's faith. Mm. And the bigger problem I see is how would you witness to somebody? Mm. How would you share to somebody and say, you know, if you believe in evolution or you think that God used millions of years and that's the way that God made, I don't think there's much hope for the non-believer in, in, your, in your witnessing when you talk to them like that. Mm. And one final passage, we always love to read John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why do we leave out the next verse? It says the reason, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This has been really valuable. Um, and I think hopefully this gives Christians watching as well as non-Christians an understanding that there's a hope after death. Death is not the end, um, but that hope needs to be realized in Jesus, in us saying yes to him, because he's our gate, he's our door. Uh, so thanks a lot, Gary, for your time. 